I love the fact that he meets with us as, with us at church. I'd hate to be here at First Baptist Church and look nice and be all prepared and, and have some well-prepared music and not have God show up. But I'm afraid many times that happens in churches. That God's not welcome. Well, he's welcome here at First Baptist Church. Not only is he welcome, we pray for it. We pray that God shows up because what we're doing without him would be in vain to be empty. If you have your Bibles open to Exodus chapter number 3 tonight, as we continue on looking how our God is a consuming fire. When I first worked on this series of messages, I did not realize that it would extend as long as it has, but that is the case in my life, I guess. Not because I keep on re-preaching the same thing, but because the Lord keeps on bringing some different aspect and truth. Encourages my heart, I don't know about you, but I've been encouraged about how our God is a consuming fire. In Hebrews chapter 12, that's where we have gathered the concept, the year in Exodus chapter number 3, Hebrews 12, verses 28 and 29 says, Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. We've looked at how our God is a fire that He rekindles. He brings revival in our life and and boy, I believe here at First Baptist Church, we've had a touch of revival in our life, in our midst. I believe at teen camp, the teens, we saw a touch of God there in a special, unique way. I heard good things about the bonfire last night. I, I see him in the services and maybe in a new and, and a fresh way that maybe we've not seen exactly uh, a month ago or two months ago. We need to be rekindled. I don't know about you, but I need to be rekindled. All right, tomorrow I need to be rekindled. It's Monday morning. I need the fire of God in my life, as do you. How quickly we can so brightly burn and then how quickly we seem to fade and, and just kind of, I don't know, uh, just not ex almost extinguish ourselves. Does it seem like that to, in your life? God rekindles us. We looked at how he rekindles us. We looked at how he reveals the fire that manifests in the judgment day that God will make known Everything that we have done or how we have built upon the foundation known as Jesus Christ. Or basically, we will give an account of our decisions, our choices, or how we live day by day. What you do tonight after church will give an account for to Jesus Christ. He's a fire that reveals. He's a fire that refines gold and silver. He refines His children to make us much more precious than gold or silver. And how we strive in our life to accumulate gold and silver. And we try to reject and sometimes reject the refinement of Jesus Christ in our life. Our God is a consuming fire. He's not only a fire that rekindles and reveals and refines, but tonight I'd like to look at how the fire of God is something that represents. If you would be in Exodus chapter number 3, we have kind of a familiar account. But in this, there is something shown to us here in Exodus 3 that perhaps we sometimes miss in the broader scope of this account. Exodus chapter 3, beginning in verse number 1, the Bible says, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of, help me, fire, flame of fire, out of the midst of a bush, and he looked, that is Moses looked, and behold, the bush burned with, and the bush was not consumed. Some of you were out at college in, in California, where there's desert. Right now, California is being ravaged by fire, are they not? Pray for those fellow believers and those who are unsaved in California. They need the power of God right now with those fires. Fire, what a devastation. My wife and I were out there in California a few years back, and as we're heading up toward Lancaster Baptist Church, the road was closed, and I did not know this before this time, but there was just desert and sand and some tumbleweed, but the fire had jumped the highway. I think at that point it was three lanes here, three lanes, and a, a meeting in between. It seemed like nothing that, that could burn, but it was all burned. 
It appeared that even the rocks were blackened by the fire, it seemed that. What a devastating, what a powerful thing. And here, Moses comes across this bush and he stops because not that the, the bush was on fire. Apparently he had seen a burning bush before. But he had never seen a continually burning bush. He didn't stop and look because it was on fire. He stopped because it was on fire and it was not gone yet. Oh, look at that bush. Well, look at that bush. Look at that bush. That's a big fire and the bush is still there. So Moses did what any man would do. With no disregard for his own life, he went to check it out. This is what most men would do. Honey, is that dangerous? I don't know, but we'll find out. This will be an adventure. Come on, kids. Honey, you are not taking the children. Oh, honey, they'll be fine. Famous last words, men. They'll be fine. Moses turned aside. Turned aside. Moses, at this point, now did not know that the angel of the Lord was appearing to him in the flame of fire. All he observed was a bush that was burning was not being consumed. Curiosity got the best of him. That's what he says. He turned aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. He did not know that he was about to encounter the God of the universe. He had no plans that day to speak to God through a burning bush, but God had plans for it. He was just apparently minding his own business on the back side of the desert with some sheep. Verse number 4. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. I will pause there real quick. So or often in the Bible, when we see these interactions, we see this response, Here am I. They ought to cause us to take note. And that ought to be our response when God calls to us to say, Here am I. But then God calls your name. There is one right response. Here am I. Here am I. Here am I. Send me. Here am I. I'll be faithful. Here am I. I'll serve. Here am I. And Moses responds with the exact right response. Here am I. He did not know what he was about to get himself into. The end of this account is where God's calling him to go back to Egypt and Moses makes five excuses in a row. All right, none of them hold any water with the creator of the universe. He says, I can't talk. No one will believe me. They won't know who you are. And God answers every one of those and with a special, unique way. But here Moses answers, here am I. Just on a side note, just for my own my own thought process. Why would you, in one sense, why would you answer? If I go home tonight and there's a tree on fire and that tree talks to me, I'm running. <laughs> Remember my John Deere lawnmower I ran from that? I'm running even faster from a burning tree that's talking to me. <laughs> Moses, Moses, Moses. He says, here am I. And here it is, verse number 5, And he said, that is, God said, Draw not nigh hither. Put off, thy shoes from off, or put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Tonight, with God's help, I want to look at how a fire is a fire that represents, and it represents the holiness of God. You see, when I say the word holiness, we begin to form an opinions and a mindset. Sometimes it's, oh, the holiness of God, uh-oh, I'm going to have to get some things right in my life. We'll look at that at the end of the service, but absolutely. Sometimes we view the holiness of God to, to be this, just this reverence 
and that God's holiness is boring. Oh, talking about holiness. Give me something exciting to, to shout about. Yet I look at this account, the holiness of God revealed, and there's nothing boring about it. We're in verse number, we're in verse number five, where God says to Moses, the place where thou standest is, is holy ground. That word holy, this is the first time in the scripture that this word is used, period, and is now the first time used to describe a place where God is at. In the Old Testament, we'll see it used another 469 times in the Old Testament, over 600 times throughout your Bible. This word holy is important to God. And God chose to reveal this particular concept, this particular character trait, this particular attribute, the first time in the midst of fire. Our God is consuming fire. Lord, I pray you'd help us in the next few moments. Lord, help us as we look at this concept. Lord, I can't in these few moments even begin to scratch the surface of your holiness. Lord, in my carnal flesh, there's no way I can accurately describe your holiness. But Lord, through your word, would you reveal your truth to us with your spirit? Would you touch us? And Lord, would you challenge us and change us tonight? Lord, if there's an area where we are not representing your holiness in our life that you'd convict us. And Lord, give us the grace to correct it so that we may be a representation of your holiness. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. C.S. Lewis said how little people who think that holiness is dull know of true holiness. When one meets the real thing, it is irresistible. Someone else said this, you can't make sense of the Bible without understanding that God is holy and this is a holy God who is intent on making a holy people live forever with him in a holy heaven. Think about the Old Testament. The whole system of Israel's worship revolved around holiness. You have a holy people with holy clothes going to a holy land, worshiping at a holy place in a holy temple using holy utensils, holy objects, celebrating holy days, living by a holy law so they might be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation to a holy God. This view of holiness is no small matter. But I fear in 2020 as Christians, we have lost the view of God's holiness. We have lost the vision of God's holiness. We have been corrupted. And it hasn't been because it's been a sneak attack, though the devil is sneaky. It's that we have allowed ourselves to be corrupted. We have chosen to be corrupted. We have allowed influences into our lives that have deterred from the holiness of God that is supposed to be in our life. As a child of God, made in His his image, which is a holy image. And a world around us who wants to tear down the holiness of God and Christians are not the salt and light. We have changed the Holy One of Israel into what we view and desire Him to be. We want God to be like we make Him to be. We want to worship God in the way that we want to worship Him and He better be happy that we're worshiping Him. That is not in line with God's holiness. In this passage, God said to Moses, draw not hither. Don't take one more step. Now help me here. What if Moses said, oh God, you're just joking. I'm going to take one more step. What do you think would have happened? I'll help you. End of Exodus chapter 3. Moses is done. Moses is done. God is that holy. In fact, we see that when they're transporting the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant. God had said, do not touch my Ark because that goes into the Holy of Holies. He said, don't touch it. When you carry it, use rods. It'll go through these rings. The priests will carry it. It had gone to the land of the Philistines and they were trying to bring it back. Now the Philistines did not want it. It brought nothing but devastation and destruction to them. Israelites are getting it back. David is, is rejoicing as it comes back. And it begins to tip on a cart. 
Uzzah touches it to catch it so that God doesn't fall off the cart. And God says, I told you not to touch it. David is mad at God. In essence, God, why are you true to yourself? Why are you doing what you said you would do? Didn't you know he was just trying to help you out? And God says, in essence, I'm paraphrasing now, that my holiness is more important than how you think you can help me out. I'm afraid in 2020 we have adopted a view of God that is not consistent, not true to the holiness and the character of God. God, you'll just be happy. You're happy that I'm here at church. And I'll come in with a bad attitude, with a, with a rotten mindset, and I'll leave the same way. But I'm at church, so God, I'm worshiping you, and that is not in line with God's holiness. I'm saved and I'm on my way to heaven, but God won't care how I live. That is not in line, not in view with God's holiness. We have relegated God into a form that fits our agenda and our own foolish lusts. And we have messed with the view of God's holiness. He often, in some minds, seems to be no more than a genie. A jolly person or a candy dispenser. God, you're there when I need you. And I'll insert my prayer request and you will dispense an answer. And please, I mean zero disreference to God. I'm just portraying how I believe we interact with our God where we pray for our food and go about our day like the holiness of God doesn't matter. But all of a sudden something happens and what do we do? We run back to the candy dispenser. God, now I need you. God, help me, help me, help me. And as soon as he so graciously, so merciful answers the request, he was an ever-present help in our time of need and that is true, then it's like his holiness is out of mind, out of sight. I'm afraid we continue in our life. Moses this particular day was forever changed by the holiness of God. Moses never went back to who he was after the holiness of God. And if we truly understand and embrace the holiness of God, we will not be the same. God was so holy, Moses wasn't even allowed to wear shoes next to him. God was so holy, Moses couldn't even approach unto him. Our God is holy. If you would, turn to Leviticus chapter 10. What I'd like to do in some small way is just build this picture of God's holiness and then very quickly give you some thoughts about his holiness. Leviticus, Levit Leviticus chapter number 10, tremendous message this summer preached by Pastor Steve Hobbins. It's the story of Nab Nadab and Abihu. Verse number 1, the sons of Aaron took either of them his censer and put, what's the word there? Fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange, what is that? Look at verse number 1 in Leviticus chapter number 10, they offered strange what? Fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said unto Aaron, This is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me. And before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. That word sanctified, I will be sanctified. That word in the Hebrew is actually where we get the word holy from. That is the foundation for the word holy in the language of Hebrew. When God says, I will be sanctified, he's saying, I will be distinct. I will be separate. I will be holy. Holy. The word in Exodus chapter number 3 comes from this word. And God used the fire to showcase His holiness. You see, holiness 
shows the distinction of God. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 2 says, There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside them, neither is there any rock like our God. The holiness of God shows the distinction of God. Our God is not like anyone, anything, or anybody else. Our God is distinct. Our God is separate. And God says, I am holy. There is no one like me. Our Bible is filled with the distinction of God. We see how God works from Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. No one else created everything but God. Our God is distinct. Our God has the fulfillment of prophecy throughout the entire Bible. He says this will happen for 430 years and this will happen. There will be a virgin birth and this will happen and this will take place. And every single one either has taken place or will take place. Our God is distinct. What other God has made prophecies and they have come true? Currently we have current day prophets. We do. Doomsayers. The end of the world is coming. They've predicted 35 of the last three depressions. Yet only our God is distinct. He's peculiar. Holiness shows the purity of God. Psalm 24, verses 3 through 5. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul into vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing of the Lord and the righteousness from the God of his salvation. I'm afraid that we have two responses to the holiness of God. One, we are unimpressed. Unimpressed. You see, we have the media now. We don't need the distinction of God because they make TV shows and movies and fake things and they're superheroes. And they can do all the things that God can do. We don't need the holiness of God. We are unimpressed by his holiness. Woe to the Christian who is unimpressed by the holiness of God. The holiness of God, the distinction of God, says you can't even wear shoes around me. You can't take one more step near me. In fact, don't get any closer, but I will allow you to speak with me. Moses, here am I. He calls your name the right response, here am I. We are unimpressed, or even worse, we are unchanged. We're unchanged. We read our Bible, we hear perhaps a sermon about the holiness of God, and if we're not careful, we will walk out unchanged by the holiness of God. God who is holy, who cannot tolerate unholiness. Somehow we think he'll tolerate it in the life of his children. Unchanged. God understands. God understands it's hard to be a Christian in 2020. God understands all of the problems I'm facing. God understands all of the influences. And you're exactly right. God does understand. He does understand those things. In fact, he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. Woe to the Christian who is unimpressed. And woe to the Christian who remains unchanged. God desires His people to be a holy people. In the account of Nadab and Abihu, fire came down from heaven. Some of you are familiar with that. I'm curious, what would our response be if that happened at First Baptist Church during the service? Now just work with me here. They were offering a sacrifice to the Lord like we do when we sing when we pray we offer our worship back to God they offered a strange fire or a insincere a non-genuine fire it wasn't what God had asked for what if fire came down from heaven when you sang words that you didn't really mean I know what would happen just like in Leviticus we'd get real serious real fast 
We would. We wouldn't leave this place unchanged. We'd leave, but we'd be running out of here to escape the presence of God. So we would be doing, but we wouldn't be unchanged. I guarantee we'd say, you remember that night at First Baptist Church? Boom, fire came down. It was fire from God. So why, just because God is gracious to us, just because God is merciful to us, why do we treat Him with such indifference? You see, the fire of God calls me to be holy. Turn with me to one more passage tonight. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter number 1. I think it's important for us to see this as a response to the holiness of God. And there is no way I could do justice to this. In fact, I won't even finish all my notes tonight. As you come to the holiness of God and you can find passage after passage. In 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter tells us in verse number 15, But as he which hath called you is holy, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Taken out of Leviticus chapter 11, verse 45, For I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Ye shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Peter says, there's a comparison. But as he. You want to know how holy we're supposed to be? Then just look to who has called us to be holy. You want to know how we're supposed to act? Then just look to the one who has called us. And that is God himself. That is the measure of holiness. And we sometimes compare ourselves to everyone else. Well, I'm holier than they are. In fact, there's a little phrase we use, right? It's someone who does that is called holier than thou. You've met these people before. Don't you want to slap them? <laughs> With a holy slap. Like, oh, who do they think they are? Better than me. Well, they're not that good. I saw them yesterday. But comparing themselves among themselves, they were not wise. The comparison in this passage, but as he, that is God. Don't compare your holiness to everyone else. Compare your holiness to the holiness of God. What does he look like? That's what we ought to look like. How does he act? That's how we ought to act. The condition he hath called you. If I am saved, if I claim the name of Christ, then this is for me. What church I go to has no bearing. What background I have been raised in has no standing. What thoughts I may approach this passage with have no merit. The condition, be as he which hath called you. If I'm saved, I've been called. And there's the command. So be ye holy. As I study this verse in 1 Peter chapter 1, I don't see a way to excuse it. I don't find, if I can, a loophole. Lawyers or companies will spend millions with lawyers to save billions with the IRS tax code. They look for loopholes to help them not have to pay what they have to pay. But with this command, you can hire every lawyer on the face of this earth and you would not find a loophole. As a child of God who is called by a holy God, we are called to be holy. It's not optional. It's not up for debate. It's not choose which one I want. I don't like door number one. I'll choose door number two. No, I am called. You are called to be holy. And then I see the criteria. In all manner of conversation. Conversation there being my lifestyle, my life. Not like we use it now, which would be how I talk, though that is included. It means in all the way that I live, in everything that I do, in every thought that I have, with every dollar that I spend, with every step that I take, with every nail that I hammer, with every decision that I make, I am called to be holy. Holy as compared to God, not as compared to everyone else my everyday life, I must strive to be holy. See, it's not merely enough to understand the holiness of God in our limited human understanding. 
We are, it's not enough tonight to walk away from the sermon and say, wow, God is holy. He reveals himself and represents himself with fire and holiness. It's not enough just to know that. Scripture does not give me the option to opt out of the command, but to strive through his grace to have the holiness that he is in my life. You see, the holiness of God calls me to be distinct. That's what Titus says. He says, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. What Titus says is, we have been saved to be a distinct people. Peter says this way, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. This is the distinction. The first thought I have for you is because God is holy, you should strive to be holy. Because God is distinct, you ought to be distinct. That means your co-workers ought to see the holiness of God in your life. Not holier than thou. That's not God's holiness. God is the truest holier than thou. He is holier than we are. They don't need to see that, but they need to see the the holiness, the separateness of God. We are distinct. He says it this way. Jesus says, ye are salt and light. If they don't know you're a Christian, you're not showcasing God's holiness. If your marriage is not distinct from your neighbors, you are not showcasing the holiness of God. If you're driving down the road and you don't drive different, this is where the rubber meets the road in all manner of conversation. That'll catch up with you later on. That distinction. I'm not talking about just at church and neither is the Lord. He's talking about every day when you wake up tomorrow to be distinct. When you go to bed tonight to be distinct. When you interact at the gas station to be distinct. In worship to be distinct. When you're at a sports game to be distinct. That's what he means to be distinct. And we get tripped up on the little things. We get tripped up by the car that cuts us off. We get tripped up by the ref who makes a bad call. We get tripped up by the cashier who gives us the wrong change back. 35 cents. It's a change shortage. Donate it. We're to be distinct. We get tripped up when the item that we thought was on sale is not really on sale, and we blow our lid because it was marked 35 cents cheaper. We've lost our distinction. But it's not just a distinction. Distinction is the character of the holiness of God. Your family, your kids ought to be distinct. People ought to say, wow, what's different about your kids? Distinct. What's different? Boy, I just heard the boss rip your face off. I'm going to tell him what I think about him. He does that to me, but why are you reacting that way? That's distinction. That's the holiness of God. The attribute that is worthy of a holy God. It calls me to, calls me to be distinct, peculiar, but it calls me to be pure. 1 John 3, 3, And every man that has this hope in him, in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. You see, the holiness of God should cause us Christians to clean out the closets. Clean out the closets of our life in all manner of conversation. To say, you know what? I'm done living this way. I'm done thinking this way. I'm done acting this way. I'm done being this way. I want to be worthy of a holy God who has holy fire. I can't be the same. I can't act the same. I can't think the same. I can't have the same activities, the same thoughts. I'm supposed to, Second Timothy says, purge myself and be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, there's that word again, holy, sanctified, set apart, and meet or fit for the master's use. And then he says, flee also some things. 
flee also youthful lusts. What's the big deal? I'll close with this. In Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. Isaiah saw a vision. He saw a vision of God in heaven. And his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain, two, he covered his face. With twain, with two of them, he covered his feet. And with twain, two, he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims. He flew unto me, having a live coal. He had fire in his hands. A live coal. Which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth. And said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thy iniquity is taken away. See, if I were to ask you to list the importance of God's attributes in order, you maybe would list them the way that a man did this to a group of ministry students, men studying for the ministry. They put them in this order, wisdom, love, power, mercy, omniscience, omniscience, and truth. And at the end of the list, they put God's holiness. Yet as Isaiah saw the vision of God in heaven, what the angel said, what the angel cried, was not not wisdom, 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 or love, 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 or mercy, 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 though those are all attributes of God. What the angels cried was holy, holy, holy. Christian, I think... I think just flat out, we miss it. I think flat out, end of the day, everything's shipped away, we just miss it. And we love the love of God, we search for the wisdom of God, we embrace the compassion of God, and we bypass the holiness of God. So my friend tonight, don't be unimpressed, and don't be unchanged. The fire of God represents the holiness of God. It wouldn't be bad for us to get burned a little bit by the holiness of God. Maybe some things you need to let go in your life. There may be some activities that you throw out because you serve a holy God. There may be some attitudes that you reject because you serve a holy God. But don't think that God doesn't care. Lord, I thank you for your word, for your truth. And Lord, you are a holy God. And you have called us to be holy. And Lord, we need a healthy dose of that holiness. Lord, help us to be honest tonight. Lord, perhaps you've touched a heart, a mind, Lord, there could be an area, there could be an attitude or attribute that does not represent your holiness well. Would you convict us tonight, Lord? Would you make us to be holy? My friend, if you're here tonight, and God's touched your heart, you come now. We'll stand a moment, but don't miss the holiness of God.